business travel program filled with unexpected twists and turns? CLC offers flexible reservations and cancellations without a monthly fee, plus travel policy controls, 24-7 traveler support, and even centralized billing and insights, all across a large network of pre-negotiated hotels with best price guarantees. Travelers can book last-minute reservations on the go with the mobile app or by just walking in with the CLC card. CLC Lodging, workforce travel that just works. Visit clclodging.com to sign up for free. It's time for Thriller Thursdays, here on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance. Chapter 30 Weston had the entire squadron of servants packed and ready to go when they got back to Cairo. Kit hadn't known quite what Fenwick was up to when he sent the telegrams, both in code, one to someone she had never heard of in Alexandria, the second to an operative in Toronto. The response, he had explained, would be two prearranged messages, one telling Weston that Fenwick was through visiting his non-existent friends in Alexandria and would be back at the Hotel Imperial within a day, and the second advising Fenwick that vitally important business required his attention and his signature immediately back in Toronto, forcing their return after what was, after all, quite a brief stay. In the end, it had worked even better than he had thought. "'I hope I didn't overstep my bounds, sir,' Weston said. "'But the man at the desk said the telegram was very urgent, and I did not want to be responsible for any delays it was in my power to avoid.' Weston had assembled the staff, got them packed, made arrangements with the hotel and for their charter flights, and packed his master's effects. Fenwick read the telegram, looked very grave, and nodded to his new butler. "'Very good, Weston,' he smiled. "'Very good indeed.' The net effect was that three hours later, having scarcely had time to process the fact that she was apparently not going to die in an undiscovered pyramid, at least not this week— Kit Baxter was back on an airplane headed for home. As relieved as she was, with no mission to prepare for this time, she was bored to tears. "'May I sit down, Miss Baxter?' It was Weston. He had been up front with Fenwick since the plane took off, and she couldn't imagine what had provoked him to wander back now, but she wasn't sorry to see him. She was, as usual, sitting apart from the rest of the staff— and while they were more subdued than on the trip in, there was a good deal of whispering going on, and Kit was fairly certain that none of it was about her for a change. "'Oh, hello, Weston,' she smiled. "'Please do. "'Is there any chance of you calling me Kit?' "'The Master generally refers to you as Miss Baxter, at least when in company,' Weston said with a pleasant smile. "'It seems improper for me to be more familiar than he is.' Kit said nothing about Fenwick being a good deal more familiar than he let on, mostly because Weston wouldn't know that she meant in a painfully platonic, fighting gangsters, killer robots, and the undead sort of way. Instead, she just smiled, also pleasantly, but waited for the other shoe to drop. "'Is something the matter?' Weston asked her. "'No,' she said, surprised. "'Why do you ask?' "'You seem to be—how oh, can I explain it?' "'You seem to be stealing yourself against something.' Kit blinked at him in astonishment. "'Why was it that the only man in her life who could tell what she was thinking had to be the butler?' "'Perhaps you are expecting a scolding of some kind?' he asked. "'Yeah, well, that would be the norm, I guess,' she replied. "'Or a lecture, or a vague threat.' Weston's brows knit. "'Have you done anything to deserve such a thing?' he asked. "'That's never mattered before,' Kit said ruefully. Weston smiled and settled back into the seat beside her. His voice dropped a touch to avoid being heard by any of the others over the steady drone of the engines, but Kit could hear him just fine. "'You do occasionally put a butler in an awkward position, you know,' he said, "'through no particular fault of your own. "'Really, when one thinks about it, it is quite unfair, "'saddling the head of a household staff with... "'this sort of responsibility for the personal lives of those under his command. "'It isn't the part of the job that I particularly enjoy. "'But someone has to do it. "'Indeed, some days one should really be issued a tranquilizer gun.' "'She blinked at him again. 
Sometimes she was so wrapped up in the business of being the flying squirrel that the people around her became mere obstacles, things to steer one's life around. She had to stop that, especially if she was to keep more of Kit Baxter in her than the Red Panda had kept of August Fenwick. Weston, she said, is it just possible that you've had a tough time lately? He smiled. I don't know if you enjoy the theater, Miss Baxter, he began, but I have always been partial to a good farce myself. Lots of running about, lots of doors slamming. I enjoy a good laugh. But I must say that they are less amusing when you are actually living one, particularly when your role seems to be that generally reserved for the vicar or, or the policeman. They never seem to enjoy themselves. That ban, huh? Kit grinned. I think I can comfortably say that your mildly unsupervised trip to Alexandria would not be on a list of the ten most potentially scandalous goings-on of this mercifully brief holiday, Weston said seriously. And I say to you, in a degree of confidence, but these are facts that everyone knows and no one will likely ever mention again. Except that David and Elsie are getting married. You really ought to congratulate them at some point. David and Elsie? Kit was mentally trying to sort out which one was Elsie. I didn't even know they were... Oh, I think I see. Yes, Wesson said. It was most sudden. <sighs> to be perfectly honest, I'm quite astonished that you didn't return to find half the household staff in some sort of mass wedding ceremony. Like one of those cults. But for the precise timing of a few slammed doors, it might very well have been as unavoidable as it was for David and Elsie. That would have put me in solid with the master, I'm certain. Kit was astonished. She had never thought about any of the other butlers as a man with a job, and one as worried about keeping it as anyone might be in tough times. I beg your pardon, Miss Baxter. I do not mean to burden you with lurid details, Weston said his moustache drawing to attention as his upper lip re-stiffed. "'No, no, it's fine,' Kit said, sorry that her silence had been interpreted as an offended one. "'The point of all this is just this,' Weston began. "'I am considerably older than you, and therefore I hope I may be allowed to observe in a somewhat clinical fashion that you are a very beautiful girl.' <laughs> "'That's a bit stuffy,' she said, her face growing hot. "'But I'll allow it, <laughs> if only because it is not the sort of thing that is observed very often.' He frowned at this. "'I beg your pardon, Miss Baxter, but I promise you that the observation is made more than daily. "'I would expect that it has been made to one degree or another by virtually every man that you have met for most of your life.' She laughed a little, and knew that she was bright red. <laughs> "'Weston, please, I don't do praise very well.' Weston smiled. No, you don't. And that is a small part of what makes me so entirely certain of the sort of person that you are, and that you do not need quite as much mining as this pack of silly geese. But the fact is that you present something of a problem to someone in my position. Her smile faded at this. I do not know precisely how to say this without risking offence, which is not my intent, Weston began. If a young lady who is in my charge is... If her reputation is suddenly much more than simply called into question, then I have failed her. Even if she was, like Elsie, going to considerable lengths to thwart my attempts to protect her interests. Now, in this case, the young man has done the proper thing and all is well, but... Neither of them said anything for a moment. I never really got the feeling that the other butlers were trying to protect me, Kit said. No, Weston agreed. They did not merely suspect your misconduct. They considered it a virtual certainty. They regarded you as an adventuress. Well, she said, I like the sound of that, but probably not the way they meant it. No, Weston agreed, probably not. They expected that somewhere along the line there would be a public scandal, and excessive financial demands would be made by you for their silence. They expected that people would look at it as a failure on their part to maintain discipline within their household, and a failure on their part to protect the master, which is also part of the job. They expected you to ruin them, and they tried their best to ruin you instead. Kit blinked hard, and was surprised to find there were tears in her eyes. 
not running down her face in some stupid girlish way, but they were thinking about it. But, Weston said with a smile, we work for a good man with a keen sense of justice. What makes you so sure of that? Kit asked, surprised. His conduct toward yourself, Weston said. There's a bit of a routine he plays for others, and I imagine it is to keep people at arm's length. That's his business, not mine, but I know a good man when I see one. Kit nodded. She did, too, and she was looking at one. I know a good girl when I see one, too, Weston said, and I do trust you. But it is nearly impossible for me to maintain discipline at times, and having one staff member with extraordinary freedom is not exactly conducive to that. Kit frowned. So what happens? Weston was all business. I have already spoken to the master, and he agrees with me that it would simplify matters a great deal if you were transferred. Transferred? she blurted. To where? To nowhere at all, Weston smiled. You already maintain your own apartment, keep your own hours, so there really is no particular reason that you should be considered a member of the household staff at all. From this point on, you shall be an employee of one of the master's corporate divisions. I work at Fenwick Industries now? she asked, astonished. You do just what you have always done, Weston said, but you do not work for me. And our relationship does not have to consist of me looking over your shoulder and having you dislike me, which I should not enjoy. He smiled broadly, which he could do now, because she did not work for him. Deal, he said, offering his hand. Deal, she grinned, shaking it. He stood up and returned to the front of the plane. Chapter 31 As with any long trip... The final moments were the worst. The airport was a circus of customs officials trying to look like they were not playing favorites with the richest man in the city, whom they had no intention of challenging in the least. There were piles of baggage and the domestic dramas of the household staff, and everyone was tired, cramped, and trying very hard not to appear irritable. Fenwick Industries had obligingly sent over at least six nearly identical bright young men in nearly identical brown suits, each with a stack of nearly identical papers for August Fenwick to sign, and a deep desire to explain to him what they were, even though he was rather obviously not listening. Kit wandered away and found a newspaper stand manned by a bored-looking kid. The newsy's eyes opened wide as she approached, and if he swallowed hard and tried to look more presentable as he sold her a daily chronicle, Kit Baxter didn't notice. Like most editions of the chronicle, the banner headline was about as subtle as a truck full of piranhas, and she broke into a wide, toothy grin as she read it. She walked back through the arrivals area with her nose buried in the story, prepared to force her way through the crowds of people surrounding Fenwick. Instead, they parted before her like the Red Sea as she approached and she knew darn well that he was laying out a little hypnotic welcome mat for her, giving the masses the sudden mental compulsion to be standing somewhere else. "'Got you a paper, boss?' she said, thrusting the chronicle into his hands. "'Thank you, Kit,' he said, as if deeply bored by the whole thing. "'That's thoughtful of you.' His languid air did not change, but she could see his eyes, and they danced like fire as they read the headline. Another rhyme crime! Poet's crime spree reaches fifth day! You know what, Kit, he said fecklessly. I'm a little bored. Are you a little bored? Yes, boss, she said. You left the car here, didn't you? he asked. The bright young men could see what was coming and looked apoplectic at the prospect. Yes, boss, she smiled sweetly. "'Perhaps a bracing drive with the top down. What do you say?' he asked. "'I don't think the top comes down on the limousine, boss,' she said. "'Should we go switch cars or something?' He nodded as if this was a grand and jolly lark. "'Yes! Why don't we do that right now?' He turned and saw clearly that all of the luggage that contained hidden panels and crime-fighting equipment had already been cleared by customs and would not be inspected further. "'Weston!' "'You're all right here, aren't you?' he asked, without waiting for a reply. It was all the pair of them could do not to bolt for the car at a full run, 
and Kit Baxter bounced a little as she opened the exit door for him, leaving a stupefied crowd standing on the platform. "'No place like home, is there?' he said quietly as he passed her. "'Yes, boss,' she beamed. "'You have been listening to Tales of the Red Panda, The Pyramid of Peril, by Greg Taylor, read by Greg Taylor and Clarissa Dunetterlanden.' This is Thursday Thrillers, audio with action on the Mutual Audio Network. Join us tomorrow on Mutual with Friday Follies, the end of the week collection of comedy cut ups. You can subscribe to the full Mutual Audio Network feed for every day of audio drama that fits your fancy, or find the Friday Follies feed in your favorite podcast players. Now that's a lot of F's. The Mutual Audio Network. Listening and imagining together.